Good morning. Welcome to Worship with Old Otterbein United Methodist Church in Baltimore, Maryland. My name is Cynthia Burkert. I'm a retired elder in the Baltimore Russian Conference, and I'm pleased to be bringing you this worship service today. Today is Father's Day, and so we celebrate all those who are fathers or who celebrate. We celebrate those who gave us life and those who have taught us and our children to live. We're delighted that you can join us in this way, and we hope that you find joy in this time together. We continue to work toward having live, in-person, and live online worship. Next Sunday, June 27th, we will be back in our sanctuary, thanks be to God. The challenge of wiring for Zoom in an old church has been quite daunting, but we are getting closer and closer, and we hope that that will be occurring in the next couple of weeks. I also want to let you know that when we do come back to worship in the sanctuary, we will be fully masked and we will be distancing from one another on the honor system. So if you come back, you won't find your favorite seat blocked off, but we do ask that you observe other good practices for health of all involved. We're grateful to say that no one in our congregation, to our knowledge, became ill with COVID during this year plus that we've been out of the sanctuary. So we're very excited to be back, but also proud of our record of keeping our congregation and our visitors safe. If you're visiting with us, whether you've ever been inside our sanctuary or you just happened upon us online, we welcome you. We are grateful that you are with us today and we ask that you come back often and check out our other recordings on our uh, website, Old Otterbein UMC 250, Org. It is our 250th anniversary year, and we continue to celebrate. I'm going to ask you if you would pray with me as we begin together. Mighty God, who speaks a word of peace to calm troubled sea, caring God, who nudges us away from fear and toward faith, ever-present God, who fills us with all, but also raises many questions without easy answers, Open our eyes to see you in our boat today. Strengthen our hearts for the challenges that lie ahead. Open our ears this hour to hear the word you speak. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The word of God comes to us from Paul's second letter to the churches at Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Since we work together with him, we are also begging you not to receive the grace of God in vain. He says, I listened to you at the right time, and I helped you on the day of salvation. Look, now is the right time. Look, now is the day of salvation. We don't give anyone any reason to be offended about anything so that our ministry won't be criticized. Instead, we commend ourselves as ministers of God in every way. We did this with our great endurance through problems, disasters, and stressful situations. We went through beatings, imprisonments, and riots. We experienced hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger. We displayed purity, knowledge, patience, and generosity. We served with the Holy Spirit, genuine love, telling the truth, and God's power. We carried the weapons of righteousness in our right hand and our left hand. We were treated with honor and dishonor, and with verbal abuse and good evaluation. We were seen as both fake and real, as unknown and well-known, as dying, and looked, we are alive. We were seen as punished, but not killed, as going through pain, but always happy, as poor, but making many rich, and as having nothing, but owning everything. Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you, and our hearts are wide open. There are no limits to the affection that we feel for you. You are the ones who place boundaries on your affection for us. But as a fair trade, I'm talking to you like you are children. Open your hearts wide too. Our gospel lesson comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. Later that day when evening came, Jesus said to them, Let's cross over to the other side of the lake. They left the crowd and took him in the boat just as he was. Other boats followed along. Gale force winds arose and waves crashed against the boat so that the boat was swamped. But Jesus was in the rear of the boat sleeping on a pillow. They woke him up and said, teacher, don't you care that we're drowning? He got up and gave orders to the wind 
and he said to the lake, silence, be still. The wind settled down and there was a great calm. Jesus asked them, why are you frightened? Don't you have faith yet? Overcome with awe, they said to each other, who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I can usually sleep through the worst of thunder, lightning, and rain. One night last week in Baltimore, we had back-to-back -back ferocious thunderstorms between 11 when I was still awake and sometime around 2 a.m. when I was sound asleep. I guess the second storm never came, I said to my husband in the morning. Are you kidding me, he replied. Worse than the first one. I slept right through it. Of course, I can sleep at home through dangerous weather because the roof is good, the basement hardly ever leaks, and we have insurance. I have a sense of security knowing that all will be well. But I can't say that's always true. When the weather is a hurricane, especially when my late mother still lived on the Gulf Coast, and even more recently when Katrina, Ike, and Harvey, and some storm whose name I don't remember, roared through my hometown in southeast coastal Texas, I was often glued to the weather channel, trying to determine which way the storm would go and just how bad it would be. And even during his, Hurricane Isabel in Baltimore back in 2003, I spent a very fretful night because we had a big old tree that was too close to our old house. The difference between sleeping and not sleeping through bad storms is in a sense of confidence in safety for myself and security for my loved ones. If I look for myself in the story of Jesus and his disciples in the little boat, I'm far more like the disciples, awake, watchful, and afraid. Probably most of us would count ourselves among them. A boat riding the waves is often used as a metaphor for the church. I heard the author Gail Godwin, the daughter of an Episcopal priest, say in an interview once, the church is the boat in which I float my faith. In other words, her relationship with Jesus Christ, her trust in God, she chose to live out in the context of a local church. It's a good image, sailing on stormy seas together, searching for the lighthouse, heading for the port. Jesus is with us in the boat, and he is also the light that guides us and the port toward which we direct our lives. There's a beautiful old song, Jesus, Savior, pilot me over life's tempestuous sea. Unknown waves before me roll, hiding rock and treacherous shoal. Chart and compass came from thee. Jesus, Savior, pilot me. In the church, we're in the boat together. We may not always like the people in the boat with us, but God has given us to each other. And we're not on a Sunday morning charter cruise, a brief interval where we get dressed up and where we can cheerfully live with each other, but just once a week and just for an hour. That works when life is easy and things are going well, or at least predictably. But when we encounter the storms of life, the uncertainty of uncharted seas, the upheaval of pandemic and transitions, questions about a destination that is not clear to us, it's good to realize that we have each other because God has given us to each other. We are in this boat together. And isn't it reassuring to know that even when we forget, which we often do, Jesus is still in the boat with us. Some of those disciples in Mark's gospel story were experienced saviors, fishermen. They knew the sea, which means that they also knew that dangerous storms came up quickly. They were used to fishing at night when the seas were calmer and the sun wasn't beating down on them. My guess is that it was second nature for some to keep watch and some to rest while they were out in their boat. But I also surmise that it was one doozy of a storm if they were terrified enough to all be awake and panicked and waking Jesus. When they cry out to him, Jesus wakes immediately and does not waste any time in responding. With a word, silence, be still, he calms the storm. Everything is changed in a moment. The word made flesh stills the sea with a word. Isn't it often like that for us? I know when I have insomnia, often I will try every one of my tricks to fall asleep and then finally say, God, 
You know I have things to do tomorrow. Can't you please help me fall asleep? And almost within minutes, I'm sound asleep. Why do we wait until the last? Why do we wait until we're in a total panic before crying out to God? God's word, a word from God, God's word made flesh make all the difference. The disciples ask, who is this? Even the storms obey him. This is the first in a series of miracle stories that are reported in the Gospel of Mark. And there's a persistent theme in this gospel that the disciples, those closest to him, struggle to grasp just who Jesus is. He's been teaching them in parables. And in the parables that precede this chapter, you'll find that often he's talking to a large crowd in parables, and then he's explaining things more fully to those closest to him, his disciples, but they're not getting it. They're not much different from us. Or let me rephrase that. They are a lot like me. I sometimes forget that Jesus, in, th in the midst of all that I'm doing, as part of a church, as one of his followers, as a wife, a mother, and a neighbor, there is nothing wrong with doing the work of the church and doing it with passion and pride. The church is an institution after all. You know what they sometimes say about a pleasure boat, don't you? It's called a hole in the water into which you can throw all your money. Well, it's one reason I've never owned a sailboat. But also, it is an apt metaphor for anything that we care deeply about. The church as an institution requires care. It requires maintenance, like any boat. The people of the church need care and nurture. And in the midst of our busyness, cleaning out a closet, keeping the books, writing the reports, cooking a meal, printing the papers, pulling the weeds, organizing the projects, feeding the hungry, planning for the future. If we forget that Jesus is here with us, then we are nothing more than a club or a social group. But Jesus is not just with us, and we are not a club. We are formed by God's will to do God's will as best we understand it. And part of what we do as a church is we continually attempt to discern what God is calling us to do for this time, in this place, in this city, in this neighborhood. We are not expected to do things alone. When there are storms, it's okay to stop relying on our own wits, to pause whatever we're doing, and to call on Jesus. It's a good thing to stop and to acknowledge, you are God and I am not. One of my favorite prayers, by the way. You're welcome to repeat it with me. You are God and I am not. Sometimes it means saying, I'm tired, I'm discouraged, I need to let someone else do this for a little while. Sometimes that means when someone else is upset to not respond to a question or a comment until tomorrow when we both had a chance to sleep on it. Sometimes it means saying simply, I can't talk about this here. I can't talk about this right now. Sometimes it means setting a boundary so that we can maintain healthy relationships within the church. Sometimes it means letting someone see your softer side to admit to being hurt, to ask for or to offer forgiveness. In those tender moments between brothers and sisters in Christ, together in this boat, the church, Jesus is most assuredly present. It is the presence among those first German-speaking Christians here at Old Otterbein in 1771, and with the many generations that have followed, that bring us to this day and that assures us of our future. You know, there's a story at the, of a, a storm. I'll start again. There's a story of a storm at the heart of the Methodist story. On his way to the New World, the only time John Wesley was ever in the American colonies, a young John Wesley traveled across the Atlantic with a group of German-speaking Moravians. On the journey, there were fierce storms, and Wesley thought for certain that he was going to die. It was a seven-week journey, usually, across the Atlantic. Throughout the journey, in the calm and through the storms, those Moravians with whom he traveled comforted, them, comforted themselves by singing hymns without any obvious fear. Wesley admired their confident faith, and he knew that he did not have that assurance in his own relationship with Jesus, even though he was an ordained priest in the Church of England. His missionary trip to Georgia was a total disaster. I won't go into all the details, but let's just say there was a 
failed romance. And he never even met any of the Indians. He was supposedly there, the Native Americans. He was supposed to convert to Christianity. He returned to London, England under a cloud and shaken in his lack of confidence. But back in London, Wesley sought out the Moravians, including a mentor named Jacob Baylor, who would walk and talk with him day after day, pounding pavement in the city of London. He continued to study and to worship and to try to figure out what it was that the Moravians possessed that he clearly did not. It was during a study on the Book of Romans in the chapel at Aldersgate in London that Wesley suddenly felt his heart, as he said, strangely warmed. He knew that every fiber of his being, he was a beloved child of God, that he could have an assurance of faith through faith in Jesus Christ. In our worship today in the courtyard, we sang a hymn that is a translation of a German hymn that Wesley translated, Give to the Winds Thy Fears. It's a hymn that he first encountered on that missionary journey to America. Methodist music historian Carlton Young writes, John Wesley's journal shows that by October 17th, 1734, while on board the Simmons bound for Georgia, he began to learn German by singing with the Moravians in their Singstunde, singing meetings, probably from a German hymn book. The first stanza of hymn 129 in the United Methodist Hymnal may have been a comfort to Wesley during the stormy voyage to journey to Georgia. So in the midst of life storms, how's your little boat? Are you rowing as fast as you can? Are you rowing alone? Or is there in you a well of confidence, an assurance of God's love, an awareness that there's someone who accompanies you along the way? I think about the Apostle Paul on his missionary journeys, traveling quite long distances by water through the Mediterranean. I've been looking at those maps of Paul's missionary journeys since I was a little girl in Sunday school, but I pulled one out again last night and I was stunned by the amount of time on his journeys that he was on water and not on land. Almost all of the cities to which he wrote his letters were accessible primarily by water, especially Corinth, on a small piece of land between two bodies of water. In his letter to the churches at Corinth, he doesn't hesitate to list all of his afflictions and hardships, although interestingly, storms at sea are never mentioned. As well, he mentions the rewards of his ministry, but the words that get my attention are in the opening sentences of chapter six, pleading with the people of Corinth not to receive the grace of God in vain. He exclaims, look, now is the right time. Look, now is the day of salvation. In other words, God is on your side right now. Jesus is with you, Corinthians, not in some future day of salvation, but in your present reality. Salvation is more than just doing right so that you can be rewarded. Salvation is more than Jesus fixing things up with God for us so that we can go to heaven. Salvation is about being saved in our present reality. In the midst of tribulation and life storms, when God is with us and we are not alone because of God's promises that we have received through Jesus Christ. Jesus is in the boat with us, listeners. Wherever you are, say the name of your town, the name of your church. Jesus is with us. The one who stills the storm and calms the waves. The one who was with John Wesley, even when he doubted, and who is with us when we doubt, when we get discouraged, when we simply forget who is the reason for all that we do. Jesus, our companion through the storms of life, our place of rest and our safe harbor when we are at our wit's end. We are all in this boat together. We are not alone in the boat. Jesus is right here with us, whatever life brings. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? May God bless you and keep you. May God show you favor and be gracious to you. May God show you kindness and grant you peace. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.